have almost 25 people. So let's uh, start our February session. Uh, and uh, today we welcome a presenter from uh, Sapiens Decision. And we will start with Larry Goldberg, uh, uh, who is a quite famous person and who is uh, uh, original co author of ZDM, the decision model that uh, paves the way to DMN and a lot of decision management tools uh, available today. And uh, of course, Larry is a person who has uh, uh, tons of uh, real world experience. That's probably the most valuable thing when I, I always when talk to Larry, I want to learn uh, his, uh, from his knowledge from real world. And uh, today uh, he will be joined by uh, two other uh, <coughs> Sapiens presenters and they will uh, present themselves. And without further delay, let's start. Larry. Jacob, thanks very much and I appreciate you having us here. Actually, uh, we decided to talk about governance, uh, not really because we thought nobody would be interested and therefore Jacob would let us off the hook, but because we really believe that uh, governance has an, an incredibly important role to play in a decision-driven world. And we're going to uh, share with you today uh, many of the reasons that we believe that. So, you know, I'm going to start with the obligatory uh, Dilbert cartoon. Um, Gil, if you will. My driver's not paying attention. Um, I'm going to start with the obligatory Gilbert cartoon um, because, you know, we always start with a Gilbert a Dilbert cartoon. But this cartoon actually is to a pretty uh, important point, and that is governance is, an afterthought, is very frequently an afterthought and very frequently is disdained by those who participate in it. So, what, you know, what that leads to is extremely uh, serious problems. Uh, some of life and death and, uh, and, and very expensive. And uh, sometimes relatively minor in terms of the results, but also could be reputationally disastrous. So in this particular stamp, see that somebody made a small error, wasn't caught, the stamp was never less sold and became a collector's piece. But the reality is that seriously flawed governance can have extremely serious problems as we know from you know, the Enron disasters. So in decision management, we, we put an enormous amount of importance on implementing uh, governance but we also tell you, we also believe, and, and we're here to tell you that it can also improve dramatically the speed of implementation, the quality of implementation, and reduce significantly the cost of implementation. So what we're going to share today is, you know, our, what we have done in terms of our practice and in our tooling to, um, to make governance a, a, a foundational part of decision management and what we what we see is the result of that. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to uh, my good friend, Gil. Actually to Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> oh, my better friend, Charlie. <laughs> yes, thank you. Charlie. So since we're gonna to be talking about governance, uh, we feel it's only uh, fitting to first uh, define what we mean by governance, both from a generic general point of view and uh, in specific for decision modeling, decision management. So governance is derived from the Greek word meaning to steer. It's a, a system of policies, rules, processes, and controls to establish organizational decisions and directions. Uh, from a decision modeling point of view, we're a little bit more uh, precise and more detailed, focusing more on for decision modeling, governance is really the review and approval of decision models for implementation in organizational systems responsible for the enterprise's solutions and operations. Uh, so in essence, you know, with decision modeling, governance is the processes and those gateways that take requirements to decision models to implemented executable decisions in your organization's uh, operations. Governance, we feel governance is uh, very key uh, for many aspects, which you'll see throughout this uh, presentation. 
but we are finding that it's not really an option anymore. Governance is becoming a, a requirement. Uh, we're seeing more and more regulations being instit institutionalized uh, because of flaws and issues with uh, um, governance processes in organizations and the impact on stakeholders. So we're starting to see a lot of new uh, regulations that are forcing governance. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, uh, you know, Systems and Organizational Control, SOC, ISO 27001. And the last two are really focused towards software development. And as decision management is uh, considered software development, those standards and being able to get certified for those standards are going to require that you have governance processes. And we feel it's important to not only have governance processes, but really take some focus on what those governance processes are to ensure they're uh, efficient uh, because ultimately governance reduces cost, risk, and time to market. Good governance processes increases team collaboration. We all know it takes a village. We all know that teams uh, are proven to be much more productive than individual contributors. Good governance processes involves many stakeholders to make the, the right decisions to in confirm the decisions in your decision models uh, to be accurate, to move them through to execution. Governance, uh, good governance uh, improves uh, reuse. Uh, by having good governance processes to one, look for reuse and design for reuse, but also governance processes to ensure new requirements make use of existing decisions that are already in your repository or use existing decisions that can be assembly uh, components for new decisions. Uh, really helps you save time and uh, increases quality over, overall moving forward through the process. Um, good governance increases quality. Uh, good governance processes around having peer reviews, having proper unit testing, uh, ensure those tests are done both by uh, the developers as well as possibly reviewers, uh, improves the overall quality of your, of your decisions. Uh, good governance increases transparency. I think the decision models in general uh, allow easier understanding of what the decisions are that are being done because they're very visual, but uh, having good governance ensures that the models are available to all the appropriate stakeholders to be able to see the models, be able to confirm the models before you implement them into uh, operations. Good governance increases uh, standardization. Uh, if you have good governance and you have standards, you ensure those standards are being followed. Uh, ensuring those standards are being followed will improve your long-term maintenance, will improve your overall quality, and good governance reduces rework. By having good governance processes, you'll catch issues earlier. And we know that catching issues earlier in development versus in UAT or in production is an exponential cost savings uh, to delivering your product, as well as catching issues earlier means that uh, you'll get better time to market. So we can see that there's a lot of uh, value added capabilities of good governance and all these value added uh, capabilities actually drive end results for your corporation. These uh, values uh, decrease your time to market. We saw reuse, uh, improved quality, minimizing rework will definitely increase your time to market. Uh, the good governance reduces cost. Again, reuse, quality, uh, no rework. Um, transparency, standardization will reduce cost. Uh, you will see that these uh, uh, value adds will reduce your risk. And, and ultimately, with uh, good governance, you'll increase your trust and confidence which also protects and secures your reputation as a company to not do decisions and implement decisions that could actually have adverse uh, effects on your organization. So we do see that overall good governance ensures decisions are responsive to the true needs of the organization. So uh, hopefully you can see the value of the governance here. And I think it's uh, governance is extremely critical uh, because I think no one wants our legacy to be an internet meme of how we published a stamp with an upside down plane. Thank you, Charlie. So um, next we'd like to look at some of the key principles of governance in Sapiens Decision. And we're using Sapiens Decision here as an example of a, of a tool that has mature, true enterprise scale governance baked in uh, essentially from the ground up. When we designed Sapiens Decision, one, some of the considerations we put into the, to the design from the very first day 
or how to achieve that um, true enterprise scale governance. We feel this is something that uh, if you don't bake in from the beginning, from the very beginning, it is in fact very difficult to um, bolt on as an afterthought later. So to us, it is one of the central tenets of, of the product. Um, and to help guide us in building out uh, this, this enterprise scalability of the governance, we laid out some key principles, in fact, eight key principles, which I'll present here, uh, that um, help, helped us along our, our journey of building this out. So the first of these is that we maintain all of the artifacts um, that are relevant in a decision management context. Uh, we maintain all of those in a central repository. And we like to refer to them not as artifacts, but as assets, because they truly are uh, strategic assets to the organization. And the assets I'm referring to, of course, are any of the components that come up in the context of decision management. So, so whether we're talking about decisions and all of their components, uh, decision services, knowledge sources, test cases, really anything you can imagine that, that is attached to the context of decision management should be an asset that you manage and govern inside the repository. So at the same time, um, you, you obviously can't have, uh, if we're talking about large organizations, you can't have a, um, a repository that has um, the common um, governance across all of it. You need to be able to federate it out into what we call here communities of discourse. So each part of the organization can have its own set of assets, its own governance policies and procedures, its own governance workflows um, as, it, as it goes through its course of business. And uh, we want the ability, of course, to be able to share those assets as appropriate and control that sharing of assets across different communities of discourse. And at the same time, also, we want to be able to mark things as private so that they are uh, things that are truly sensitive, things such as, let's say, fraud, um, any kind of fraud detection logic um, would be something that's typically sensitive in most organizations. That's something that shouldn't be shareable anywhere. So you want to make sure that that is uh, suitably protected. So all of that uh, plays into the federation of the repository into what we call communities of discourse. So that was another key component. Um, every asset itself needs to be versioned and we need to have full visibility into all the previous versions and being able to um, access those and view those at any time. Uh, but also a very important tenant around the versioning of the assets is that once an asset has been versioned, that version is immutable. So once something has been approved into the repository, you can never change it. You can, of course, create new versions of it. You can retire versions, let's say, but uh, every version itself, once it's been approved, is immutable. And once we have an immutable asset version, uh, we want to be able to know where, you know, have, have access to its full history. So where did this particular asset version come from? Um, what sources, what knowledge sources does it tie to? So we want to manage the asset versions themselves and all the relationships. And for each of those, we want to know who created it and when, uh, who reviewed it and when, who approved it and when, uh, where it was deployed, and anything else you can imagine around traceability and auditability. So you need to keep maintain that, that history. Um, another aspect of the asset version, of course, is that it has a life cycle status, and we want to be able to maintain and know at any particular time what that life cycle status is. I mentioned earlier, once an asset is approved into the repository, it becomes immutable. That ap approval is a life cycle asset uh, event. So we want to identify various statuses. Here I just called out three simple ones, draft, candidate, approved. You can imagine more. Uh, in decision, we actually do have more, but we'll go with just these three for now. Uh, so every asset has this lifecycle status associated with it, and we want to be able to move that asset um, uh, through its life cycle. And the, way, the only way to do that is through a governed workflow process. And what that means is that we set up this um, governed workflow process to drive the reviews and approvals that we want to establish for each asset, uh, for each change really. Uh, and only through that workflow do we change the lifecycle status. That is the only means by which we can, we can change that lifecycle status. An, an interesting point to make here is that those workflow processes of course can vary by community. So each community, again, the repository is, is divvied up into multiple different, is federated into multiple different communities. Each community can have its own workflow processes. So the community can determine for themselves what kind of reviews, what kind of approvals they want, how many, what, what detail, uh, how detailed they want their process to be. But in any case, that process is what controls the life cycle of the asset, not just the life cycle of the, the change task itself, but also the life cycle of the assets themselves as they go through it. 
So that is the uh, workflow process. And then the last aspect, the last principle we'd like to call out here is that, uh, and this one's optional, the other seven, I guess, are not really optional. They're key tenets and key principles that we follow throughout the tool. But uh, this last one is, is definitely one that's optional, it's configurable. And it ties very closely to the regulations that Charlie talked about. A lot of those regulations require segregation of duties. And what we mean here is the ability to uh, separate out um, the abilities of doing certain things. So even if the user, the particular user in question has the technical rights and permissions to do multiple of these things that are called out, author, review, approve, uh, and uh, enforcing segregation of duties requires that they can only do one of those in a particular change. So if we're looking at a, the change for a particular asset uh, with segregation of duties, a user can only create, review, or approve that particular asset version and not more than one of those. So you have the option of setting up your workflows to enforce that segregation of duties. So those were the eight principles we established. Um, and interestingly, when we went to actually um, develop those or use those, we found that they are actually can be grouped into four key domains of the, of the repository. So we call these the four domains of enterprise scale governance. And the domains are repository, glossary, modeling, and DevOps. So on the repository side, here we're talking about, um, and actually before I go there, I should mention the, the, the key driver for these domains is the, the stakeholders that are involved. So each of these four have uh, a different set of stakeholders and I'll talk through those. So the repository domain is all about how do we structure the repository? How do we control who has access to what? Uh, how do we control the movement of artifacts across uh, the different uh, communities within the repository? So all of those things, of course, are of importance to ensuring the, align the alignment of what we're doing with corporate policy. So this, of course, would be of key interest to, uh, let's say, more senior management as, as the key stakeholder there. Uh, glossary is perhaps the most central thing we do uh, in decision management. The terminology we use uh, is, is really the glue that holds everything together. It's what provides understandability. Um, uh, it's what provides the means for the business speak that we use in the um, logic models to tie to the tech speak that we use in the actual implementation. So we have the ability to map the business friendly terminology to the technical terminology. So glossary is really key and fundamental to, to everything. Uh, so very, very important that we govern all the glossary assets in a robust way. And the key stakeholders here, of course, would be uh, the data people on the one hand, um, modelers on the other, and for the technical implementation, of course, IT as well. On the modeling side, we're talking, of, of course, about uh, the management of all of the logic artifacts, so decisions and all their components, decision services, et cetera. Uh, and the key, the key stakeholders there would be the modelers and the business owners reviewing those models as part of the governance process. Lastly, on the DevOps side, here we're talking about the um, the taking the of the approved models and deploying them into the execution environments, making the, the, the logic actually operational in the organization. The key stakeholders being, of course, IT. So looking in uh, maybe a little more detail into how the governance is actually done and what, what governance opportunities we have uh, in Sapiens Decision. So we'll look at each of the domains in turn. So on the repository domain, uh, as we mentioned, we have the opportunities to enforce governance around the uh, creation and management of the repository community structure, around all of the access rights to the different components uh, in, the, in the community structure, and for the movement of assets between the communities. On the glossary level, or uh, the glossary domain, uh, here's where we want to control and, and govern, carefully govern the creation and management of the business friendly terms. So we have a role specifically from a permissions point of view, we have a role specifically for, for the review and approval of that. We call that a glossary administrator. We have um, the ability to manage and govern the mapping of those business friendly terminology, our terms to the technical terms. And we also wanna be able to control the movement of terms between glossaries as you have uh, obviously a federated structure, some terms might be of interest to share across uh, different communities. So we have the ability to move and govern that movement of terms between those federated glossaries. On the modeling domain, uh, 
here's where actually it's kind of funny that the majority of what we do in decision management, creating decision man, creating decision models and governing those, governing those decisions, governing those decision services is all kept encapsulated here in two words, asset versions. But um, the, the, that asset versioning is the key to everything we do. So that is where we uh, want to manage, cre sorry, create and manage those various assets and manage them throughout their entire life cycle. So here's where you have the, the governed workflow processes that I mentioned a couple of slides ago as one of our key principles. Um, also offering the ability for the different communities to have their own uh, workflow processes as part of that asset versioning. Gil, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, when you're talking about uh, versioning, you uh, offer your own versioning or you use standard version control system like Git or SVN? So we do all the versioning within the within the repository. So we manage it ourselves. We don't the, the source control. We don't we don't utilize an external source control. It's all managed within the tool itself. But then you have to keep uh, in sync your rules uh, that uh, in this version control and uh, objects that come from Java or from C sharp or JSON, and it's a different version control. How do you solve this problem? So that interface uh, is actually uh, handled more at the um, in the DevOps layer, which we'll get to in a moment. But the the point is that anything we deploy f at the end of the day from um, decision uh, would be a essentially a, ser a decision service, and uh, you would manage the interface with of that decision service with the external world uh, independently because it is service based. So. Um, we're talking about a loosely coupled structure here. Uh, we wouldn't tie directly to um, um, versions that you're maintaining else elsewhere other than through a loosely coupled connection. So to yeah. be clear, the glossary itself, uh, sorry, the um, repository itself contains no executable code other than when we do the testing, it would create executable and would test internally, but but the, the repository is not of executable code. The repository here is all of models. And uh, we would externalize that code into a, uh, into, you know, whatever version control uh, environment is in the DevOps environment. Yeah, the other thing to note is, you know, we don't do the models in somebody handcrafts the code. Everything done in decision is any code generated from is generated from decision models, so completely technology agnostic, immutable. Um, you have you do the modeling, you deploy as part of the deployment process. You'll pick the technology you're targeting, and we will generate the code. So having the models and having all the versions uh, in the repository, we can always regenerate the code from scratch and get the exact same result. Does that answer your question, Jacob? Uh, Okay, I don't want to interrupt. Uh, maybe we can talk at the end about q and Okay, sure. All right, so uh, the same kind of governance that we, we're talking about for asset versions, we apply also to knowledge source versions. Um, and then for test cases, of course, the tool has a robust testing capability and as part of the governance, we can enforce that testing, uh, uh, that as part of the review process, we can enforce that testing was actually done. And so for that, we have the ability to have uh, rigorous test cases, automatic test case generation, uh, comparison of the test cases against expected results, things like that. And then lastly, on the DevOps side, uh, which I think ties most closely to your question, Jacob, we have the ability to uh, package up and govern the packaging up of, of the approved models into uh, deployment packages, and then the ability to govern the deployment of those packages to particular environments. So for each environment, for each environment, for each package actually, and for each environment, you can set up uh, its own governance to determine who can and determine who can review and approve um, those packages and those deployments to those particular environments. So very robust governance. And as you can see, we have the opportunity to uh, implement that robust governance. A lot of this is configurable, so you don't actually have to do force enforce all this, but you can set up to configure the tool and set up it, set it up so it is required. Um, so you can implement this robust governance across the entire breadth of the tool, everything from the repository to the glossary, to modeling, to DevOps. And over to Larry. Thanks, Gil. So, you know, one of the most important aspects um, of governance is we believe that it speeds time to market. And 
This is actually taken from a real world example. Uh, this is a client in the financial services space, obviously a highly regulated space. And in this highly regulated space, uh, this particular financial institution has to change the terms that uh, it, it deals with its clients when there is, say, a catastrophe in that particular geography, geographic area. And uh, the catastrophe that I'm taken as an example here is uh, a major uh, cyclone or a major hurricane, I guess you call it here, in the United States. Um, in, in 2005, with the Katrina uh, catastrophe in New Orleans, um, this was before decision management was implemented in this institution. It took them about 90 days to make the changes to their rule structures. They, they had an advanced rules engine. They were pretty proud of their implementation and they were pretty happy that they were able to make changes in, in no more than 90 days uh, at that time to implement all the changes that they had to make to cater to their client base uh, in this environment. Post the introduction of decision management in 2009 and 2010 with what we call early decision management, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, they were able to reduce that time to about less than three weeks. And it was the subject of, you know, a, a CIO a tweet and a CIO uh, a, a communication about how well they had done in terms of collapsing that time scale. Now go forward to advanced decision management in 2017, Hurricane Harvey, with truly mature decision management with all the improved processes, they were able to make changes um, to their uh, terms with their clients uh, in a matter of a day. They call it rule in a day. And there are a lot of aspects that go into this, um, this speed of change and into this integrity of change. But one of the proof points uh, in this particular uh, environment was that the client uh, expressed to us that there was a very high level of trust of the processes that were in place to make the changes such that the management had a lot of confidence in the changes that were being made and rolled out and could and could live with and could, um, and could enjoy this reduction in time, the speed to market, without having to be concerned about the kinds of catastrophes that could occur from something that is too rushed and that's something that isn't sufficiently well thought through. So again, the key to good governance the, the key to the value of good governance is what it actually represents to the business. And so when we see this level of confidence, when we see this level of speed of change, when we see this level of effectiveness of change, we understand that governance brings a huge amount of value to it. And that's you know, the key to why we focused on governance in, uh, in decision. And really here endeth our lesson. Um, our conclusion, you know, organizations are unlikely to reach the full potential of decision management without strong, integrated and automated governance. You can do it externally from your tool or you can do it internally within your tool, but do it. So thanks very much for having us, Jacob. Any questions, we'd be very happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, please ask questions. We have one question already on the Slack. Darka, you can actually unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, thank you. Uh, the question is here, if I have the repository of say decisions or repositories how you have it. How do you organize these so that the stakeholders can access them and navigate them easily? Because just mm. having them sorted alphabetically does not help. Yeah, right, right. Um, and the answer is that, you know, this is, I think uh, the key to a good repository is the ability to navigate that repository 
um, across the, the, all the relations of all the assets. Um, we have quite a few tools that are built into the, uh, into the user interface, one of which is a actual a navigator. And what, it, what it'll do is represent all the assets on the screen and you can click to it, you can click any of them, they're hyperlinked to the actual underlying assets. So in that way you can traverse the, the repository very easily. Um, you know, the, at the end of the day, the, the, the decision model is, you know, is a semantic model. So most of the navigation is done through the use of those semantics. Gil, do you want to add, or Charlie, do you want yeah. to add? Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. Add, I'll add a couple of things. Um, so, so, you know, definitely what we said is, you know, having a standard navigator uh, is good. So people know where decisions are. They know the communities, they know the folders. Uh, that's one way to get to assets. We also have a, a very uh, advanced search engine. So the ability to search by, uh, you know, looking for assets based on different data and uh, metadata related to the assets is another way to find them quickly. And then we also have uh, additional info, which for any asset, we have an additional info panel that tells you all, its thing, all the items it's associated to, all the versions of the assets, and all its uh, relationships to any other asset in the repository. So we give a, a, you know, three different ways of actually finding and navigating and, and locating assets. Uh, Gil, I don't know if you have any more to add. I do, I do. <laughs> so in addition to everything that Larry and Charlie said, um, we, the, it all starts, I guess, with the structure of the repository. So going back to what I talked about in, in the, as part of the governance, um, structuring the repository and giving people only access to what they need to be able to see limits, you know, limits what they can see and what they can do. Uh, so that's part of it. Of course, we have all the tools, the search tools, the additional info that uh, Larry and Charlie mentioned. Um, one addition, two additional features that we have that come that come into play here. One is we have the ability to provide deep links and publish deep links, so that if you want a particular stakeholder to review a particular asset in the tool, you can just give them the link and go directly to the asset. And so they don't really have to know how to navigate to the asset. At least they can go directly to it. Uh, and then from there, you can pick up with the uh, cross-references, the automatically maintained cross-references uh, that Charlie was referring to as the additional info. Uh, the second piece is, in fact, the user doesn't even need to go into the tool at all. We have separately from the, kind of a separate offering, we have a uh, decision viewer capability. Uh, so just like you can publish an Adobe uh, PDF, an Acrobat PDF, we can publish a decision and they can open it up in the viewer and uh, no, no, you know, no further tooling needed, just a browser. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's another option. Yeah, and I guess um, one thing just to also be clear, which might be implicit, but just in case it isn't, is if it's part of the governance processes that we're expecting somebody to review or approve through the governance processes, they're all getting uh, tasks in a task queue. Uh, so they get their own work queue of work uh, and tasks to follow up on. So that task will actually open them up right directly to an asset to, to do the review and do the work that they're expected to do from the task. Okay, Gil, can you show this uh, how it looks in decision model in browser? Can you show an example? Um, yes. Okay, it would uh, be nice. give me a minute here. And yeah, give me a minute. <laughs> any other questions so far? Yeah, this is uh, Jan Emery. I have a question for you about knowledge sources. Can you talk a little bit more about how knowledge sources get used in the governance process through Sapiens? Sure, Charlie, do you want to do that or do you want me to? Uh, you, can, you can do it if you're... So knowledge source is an external document or an external um, uh, reference. And so in the uh, repository, we would, we would store a link to that document or that resource. And uh, while when in the repository, that link is uh, visible, uh, when you're on the asset in the additional uh, information pane, and then you can click on that link and open that asset. And so it depends on how intelligent your deep, your links are in your documents. So in a, you know, in a PDF, we can link to a given passage or a given paragraph or a given page uh, as a knowledge source to, and the knowledge source can be attached to, you know, any level of assets. So it could be attached to a whole community. It could be, uh, well, not really a community, but to a whole, to a whole decision model or to a, Sub, uh, sub decision or to a uh, even a row within a um, 
within a, a decision table. So, um, so what we're storing is a link. And so that link would be to all the external references. Does that help at all, Jen? Yeah, I'll just maybe add to that in that, you know, the, the links themselves and, and we would, each knowledge source would still be considered a version of maybe an external document. We would uh, also still go to the approval of those associations to the asset that is right. part of the approval. And then if you're approving the asset itself that has the knowledge sources, the approver would also see those knowledge source links and may go back to the source document to make sure that, you know, what that knowledge source represents is properly reflected in the, in the logic. Uh, if it is a requirement document per, per, per se that goes with the decision. So that, that kind of helps round out the process. And I'm sorry if you said this, are they always external freestanding documents or would it, could it be like to another tool? It could be a different tool. Um, for, from our perspective, we, we, we kind of, in our tool, the knowledge source is kind of a proxy to represent something external, but it allows you to enter a, a this definition of a proxy of, an, of another element or artifact uh, you can create custom properties, uh, metadata that you want to capture with that by its type. You can have different types of knowledge sources. So if it is a link to, say, a BPMN process tool, you can type it as a, a knowledge source that's a BPMN type, and you can have different metadata that you capture with it. And it can have a URL link back to that process tool. Or it could be, like I said, it could be a document in SharePoint, which is a requirements document, and you would type it as that. And you could have a link to the uh, your URL to the SharePoint to open it up from within uh, the modeling tool, decision, safety decision modeling tool. Yeah, that and linking, yeah, and linking to an external tool is a classic uh, way of, uh, that knowledge sources have been implemented in, in decision. Great, yes, thank you, that's helpful. Okay. More questions? Uh, Gil, you have something to show? Yes, I do, uh, okay. share screen again. So, did that work? I'm not seeing your screen yet. Yeah, 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 I have to hit the share button. There we go. Okay, you should be able to see it now. So this is our viewer. Um, so uh, basically what would happen is just like somebody sends you a, a PDF to open it in Adobe Reader, somebody would send you an export from Decision Manager, from Sapiens Decision Manager. Um, it would be a zip file. You go to a particular URL, uh, which is, I'm running, right now I'm running it locally, but you'd go to a particular URL. Uh, which we publish and load your file. And that's it. And you're done. Oh, and it, can you uh, actually show the lo file loading? Gil, a little sure, bit. sure, sure, sure. Actually, the way to load is just drag it. So you just go over here. Mm -hmm. uh, here I have some samples. So we can do this. Uh, I don't know. We'll do this applicant child care eligibility. Just drag it. And there it is. Mm -hmm. And, and all, the, all these links are alive, right? Yeah. And yep. you can double click to. Yep. Uh, Look yeah. at the Go decision on. table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can link through the decision yeah. tables. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But this is viewer, right? This is viewer. a viewer. Okay. This is a viewer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. More questions, please. Okay. If if you don't have questions, I want to uh, take this opportunity that uh, we, when we have vendors uh, on decision camp sessions, we always ask them, "Can you tell us?" Uh, one or two features that you recently added to your product and you're really proud of? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the most uh, important additional new features um, is the new, our new test engine, you know, uh, decision led the way, I think, uh, in terms of test capabilities um, many years ago Eight, seven, eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, we incorporated uh, this testing tool, our testing tool in Sapiens Decision, which allowed um, the user to generate test cases or import test cases or key in test cases and test um, their decision models against uh, that data for the outcome. What we've done in the new release uh, of decision, which will be decision 7.0, uh, is not only um, implement a brand new user interface, of which, by the way, the viewer is an example, um, uh, which complies more closely to the DMN standard than the old TDM uh, 
um, models that we had in the old in the previous version of decision but we also implemented a much more robust test engine that allows for very large scale testing and by large scale testing i mean being able to test real you know real uh, production level data scale uh, within the tool or even uh, establish the testing tool as an external service, as, a, a, um, as an implemented uh, a, a testing service. And, um, and that's something that we're very proud of. So it's integrated right now into the tool and it's just part of the tool, but in due course, we'll be providing it. So the new tool, the Decision 7.0 is designed as a, uh, a cloud-based service um, and uh, the testing service is seen as an additional uh, service that we'll be providing uh, on our cloud-based uh, offering. So that's yep. something you want to add, Charlie? Yeah, I would just say just in, in general, uh, one of the big focuses we've done over the last uh, year and a half is really uh, plan our version seven iteration of the product which is a, a complete revamping of the uh, user experience with the product, uh, a brand new UI, which uh, I think uh, we're very proud of. It's not only do we feel it simplifies and is easier to pick up and use, we find that we've, uh, based on our learning over the last eight to 10 years with uh, the original version of the Sapiens Decision, uh, we've learned how to, you know, be more productive for our users. So we built a, a user experience that will help them to be much more productive on modeling and, and decisions, uh, working within the tool, navigating, and you know going through the life cycle, and, and including what we're talking about today on governance. Is you know although we've got all the same features and all the capabilities of governance, we've also streamlined the governance process to be much more productive and, and easier to work within uh, to help to you know, move decisions from requirements to implemented uh, executing decisions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of potential uh, customers here. Do you have to ask more questions? Okay. If not, I just want uh, in conclusion to thank you, uh, our presenters for really interesting presentation. And uh, I also want to stress that uh, uh, DM community recently published a benchmark for different uh, digital decision making platforms. Quite simple, but it uh, deals with a huge uh, decision table. And while majority of uh, decision, rule engines and uh, decision making platforms are uh, very efficient today, uh, we do have situations when you have to run not even millions, but uh, almost uh, hundreds of millions or billions of uh, transactions per day. You probably uh, have the same situations and uh, it would be nice if sapiens and all other vendors would uh, submit the solutions for this benchmark and uh, if you don't have any questions thank you very much everybody and see you next month thanks jacob thanks, thanks for having me